Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of the book of Amos, the prophet that God sent from the south in Tekoa, which is south of Jerusalem, up to the kingdom of the north, uh, Israel. Okay? Yes. And uh, in our uh, the first parts of our study, we looked at how God had used the prophet to speak out his, his judgment against the nations surrounding Israel and Judah. And then in the last part, he spoke to his own people in Judah. And now he is speaking specifically to the people of the kingdom of Israel, where he has sent Amos to prophesy. Okay? Okay. So we're going to pick this up in Amos chapter 2, starting at verse 6. And I'm going to break this down into, into parts, okay? Mm-hmm. And we're going to look at this as the proclamation that God makes through Amos, all right? We're going to look at the proclamation, then we're going to look at the cause. And then we're going to take a commercial break in the middle, as one does. <laughs> and then we're going to look at the call to action and the people's response. And finally, we'll look at the Lord's response to, to this, okay? Okay. All right, so we're going to start in verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, God's proclamation. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. It says in the King James, he will not turn from it, right. right? God has reached a point where he is going to deal with his own people there, okay? And then he goes on to start talking about the cause of this, the need for this taking place. So continuing on in in verse 6, and I'm going to go to verse 8. He said, because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair pair of sandals, those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble. And a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar, And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. This is the cause of having to send Amos to prophesy. I said, here's where we take the commercial break. Mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden we're not looking at at Israel, but we're looking at the Lord God Almighty, starting in verse 9 when he says, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, I even destroyed his fruit above and his root below. It was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I led you in the wilderness 40 years that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. Don't come back. And now the call to action, starting in verse 11. He says, Then I raised up some of your sons to be prophets and some of your young men to be Nazarites. Is this not so, so, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine, and you commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Now we're going to look at the Lord's response to all of this. Starting in verse 13, going to 16, he says, Behold, I am weighted down beneath you as a wagon is weighted down when filled with sheaves. Flight will perish from the swift. And the stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. Okay, now let's let's look at that. I wanted to go through it, but let's look at it. Mm -hmm. I said... The, the proclamation. God is making a proclamation. Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty, is a just God who watches over his word to perform it. Sin separates a person from God. That's what it says in Isaiah 57, right? And separation from God is death. Yes. That's the wages of sin. This is what God is saying. This is his proclamation, okay? Mm-hmm. His proclamation is that they have transgressed. And that's why he can't revoke He's taking action. He's obligated by his own word to take action against them. All right. And then the cause of this is the corruption of pride and greed that existed 
primarily in the leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And the religious leadership, the political leadership and the religious leadership in the nation, the kingdom of Israel. Now, you know, it says in Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goes before destruction mm -hmm. and a haughty spirit before a fall. There was pride here. What do you think leads people to feel like they have the right to abuse other people and take from them what is rightfully those other people, belongs to those other people? Because they're better than them. They're better than them. It's a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Okay? They couldn't do that without pride. And pride is the gateway to all sin. Okay? That's in, listen, we can't overstate the importance of this. Pride is the gateway to all sin. Yes. It says in Proverbs 6, starting at verse 16, and you may know this, six things does the Lord hate, yes. yea, even seven are an abomination. But in verse 17, it says, haughty eyes. This is how it starts. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are an abomination to the Lord. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent. It starts with haughty eyes. That's pride. Yes. And then in, in the New Testament times, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul is talking about the perilous, well, he says, but I, but realizes in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. It starts with lovers of self. Mm -hmm. That's pride. Now, a, a lot of people, and I've heard this over, over the decades, because God is dealing with the way the poor people are being treated in Israel, that Amos is preaching a social gospel. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Right? The simple fact of the matter, he is not preaching a social gospel for the simple reason that there is no social gospel. Mm. I, I, we were talking about this the other day, and I said, you know, I spent a lot of time years and years and years ago uh, having contact with and with uh, people that I knew who were involved in ministry in Latin, all through Latin America. Um, and it was called liberation theology. Well, all of this, you know, there's not a liberation gospel. There's not a, there's not a prosperity gospel. There is not a social gospel. There is the gospel. Amen. The highest command, the foremost command, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You want to know something? The gospel is one. That's right. But see, the thing is, that gospel encompasses everything. Absolutely. Pertaining to everything. Pertaining to because everything. we're talking about God's word. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is the word. Right? Yes. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, Jesus is the Word of God. And He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. There is nothing outside of Him. All right? Think about what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 3. He said, Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. God has given us. His word covers everything that we need, okay? Think about, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 12. I'm going to start at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them reasoning with one another, and seeing that he, we're talking about Jesus there, answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Right? Love God, love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. all, of the law, all of the law and the prophets depend on this. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 22. James calls loving your neighbor as yourself the royal law, James 2.8. But here, the people that he's speaking to, they did not. They did not love others, all right? Mm -hmm. they, they're obviously, they didn't love God. Who were they loving? Lovers of self. Yes. It's all about pride. And that's exactly what pride is. It's exalting yourself. The foremost command, the royal command is in a word, love. Okay? The fruit of love may be, and this is about social stuff, it may very well be feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, 
giving shelter to the homeless, that that may be fruit of God's love working in our lives, okay? But it is just that. It is the fruit, the, the result, the evidence. But that's not what love is, okay? That's not what love is. What is love? Okay, thanks for asking. I'll tell you. <laughs> we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. 1 John 3.16-18 through 18. You see, the demonstration of love in deed and in truth is this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word and tongue, but in deed and truth. All too often, the, the focus of a so social gospel becomes, becomes meeting the needs of the flesh and ignoring the needs of the, of the spirit, all right? What's the need of the spirit? Save Jesus. And I'll say, oh, oh you, you, got, you got that right. Okay. And well-intentioned, many, many well-intentioned programs become nothing more than comforting the lost, sending well-dressed, fat, lost souls on their journey to hell. Because if you feed them, but don't give them Jesus, that's all you've done. If you clothe them, but don't give them Jesus, that's all that you've done. We need to be proclaiming the love of God that brings salvation to all who will receive it. That's Jesus and him crucified. <clears throat> It's not about, it, I don't really know if I want to go here, but I'll, I'll go here just briefly, and then you can get all upset and I'll come back. Um, we're, we're actually doing this study right now, the day after President, the United States President Donald Trump met with Pope Francis in Rome at the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And as they sat there together, um, I just had this picture well, praising all things spiritually is what you were doing. Well, because that's what we're called to do, that's is right. to appraise all things spiritually. Yeah. Trump, a very worldly man, mm -hmm. now sits at a point of power, worldly power, that is not surpassed pretty much any place else in the world. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, Francis represents the spiritual head, of at least like half of the people on the face of the earth that call themselves Christian. And Francis is very, very well known for his social gospel. Yes. And remember, he came out of Latin America, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what he, he, he had the opportunity to see a lot of poverty. And that's the gospel he was imbued with, was that social gospel, mm -hmm. which he has practiced since he came to the office of the papacy. And Donald Trump is a man... I, you know, listen, the facts are the facts, and it's demonstrable that he certainly loves money. Yes. So you have, what you have there is this, I, I'm, I'm looking at this combination of world power and religious power, a, 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 a gospel of prosperity on the one hand, and that's what he was elected on, Trump, yes. and a gospel of social doings on the other hand. Yes. Yeah. But the thing that wasn't in the middle of that table, in the center of that table, was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's absent from there. It reminds me of the time that Francis went to, to the Mideast. And yes, Israel is part of the Mideast. He went there and he stopped and visited with the, uh, help, help me out here, I think it was a boss uh, from, from Palestine. Mm. And then he met with Sharon, Sharon uh, the, president the president of, of Israel. Israel. Yeah. And at the end of their meetings, he invited them to come and pray with him at the Vatican, which they did. So here you had the head of the Roman Catholic Church, 
the president of Israel and the president of the Palestinians, and they're praying together. I don't know who they can pray together to, but Francis said to them and said to the world, we need to put aside the thing that divides us. That, listen, you can look this up. I mean, you know, I, don't, I, I never ask you to take my word for this. Go check the facts. What divides the Roman Catholic Church, the Jewish faith, and Islam? Jesus. Ta-da! The stumbling block. So are we going to, you know, are they willing to put him aside mm-hmm. so that they can all get the gospel of Rodney King? Can't we just all get along? What's the one thing that the gospel of, of Jesus Christ requires? Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without him and him cru- crucified, we got nothing. There's, there's no, that's right. There's no faith. Okay. But that's, that's my point. It's like what they were talking about was bringing peace to the world today. But the word of God says that Jesus, he himself is our peace. So if the meeting is devoid of Jesus Christ, they're just blowing smoke. Okay. I, I mean, I don't mean to get off track. But we're being led, our goal here today, our goal in life, when I say our, I am talking about the saints of God, the bondservants of God, the remnant. We are led by the Spirit, and He uses His Word to lead us. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, right? Mm -hmm. So, otherwise, we're not the children of God. Those who are being led by the Spirit, those are the children of God, right? Spirit witnesses that. So be on your guard. Be, be on your guard, okay? Test all things. Now, I said we we're going to have to take a commercial break because we've been talking about Israel. We've been talking about the problems in Israel. We've been talking about the sin of Israel. But now God changes the subject entirely. It's like, okay, you're watching a show on the telly, and all of a sudden, pow, there's a commercial for something else. That's why that came to my mind. As the people of God came out of Egypt having been delivered from bondage. And they came through the parted waters of the Red Sea and crossed through the wilderness, taking an inordinate amount of time because of the hard-hearted attitude that gave them disobedience. But anyhow, the new generation finally came to the Jordan River. That's a 40 years of wonder, right? And I'm going to read from Joshua 4, starting at verse 19. Okay. Joshua 4, I'm going to read 19 to 24. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. Remember, he poured it. They didn't just part the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan River as they crossed it. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord, your God, forever. Those who are abiding in sin among his people here have forgotten a loving God who would state through the Apostle Paul what had been evident from the beginning. In Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And then he goes on in verse 19 and says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's reminding him, listen, why why do you try, why do you do these things? Why do you have greed? I'll I'll supply, and he's proven it. Don't you remember? What I've done. What I've done. Don't you remember that when you were hungry, I sent down manna from the sky, from the heavens? Don't you remember the things I've done? Why, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you living the life that you're living? Why are you living in this disobedience? Don't you remember my love for you, all right? The problem was then, 
as it is all too often today, the people of God are not focused on their needs, but on their desires. And as Paul also said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. 2 Timothy 4.3 Are you looking for your own desires or are you looking for God? God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, not of those who are seeking what you can get, all right? So anyhow, let me get back to the breaks over. Let's look at the people's response. The people's response to the word of God through the prophet was to reject it, all right? In verse Two, chapter 2, verse 12, we're going on. He said, but you made the Nazarites drink wine and you commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. Now, the Nazarites, these were men and women who had made a vow to the Lord that set them apart, to be set apart. It had to do with drinking wine. It had to do with uh, their, their hair and it had to do with you're not allowed to go out and have anything to do with, with dead, all right, the dead. But the issue wasn't about wine or hair but about a group of people who are willing to sacrifice to be holy. And their holiness shone a bright light on the unholiness of the corrupt. It stood out. It stood out. That's I've said this so many times. If you're walking in faith, it's going to challenge those who don't have faith. They will either, they will either hate you for it or they'll be encouraged to do it by you. All right. So with the prophets, well, think about this. I mean, Stephen, in his proclamation of history, of the history of God's people, remember when he was being persecuted and going to be stoned to death? He said, talking to the, to the Jews there, he said, which, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Acts 7.52. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. All right, Matthew 23, 37. They kill the prophets. Now, they're telling the prophets here, don't prophesy. Because if you do, there's there's the implied threat. What's the implied threat? We're going to kill you to death. So let me ask you a simple question. Why do they kill the prophets? Think about it. Why did they kill the prophets? I'm going to give you a few reasons. Or let me ask you this. Let me ask you a rhetorical. Would they kill the prophets if the prophets came along with a message saying, God wants you rich? <laughs> no. I don't think so. Would they kill the prophets if they came along saying, well, God's promising you a better job, a fancier car, a nicer house? Would they kill those prophets? I don't think so. Would they kill the, pro- the prophets who would promise you that God would, no, no, that God must give you thousands of dollars if you just send them a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if if I promise you I'll give you a $10 bill for every dollar bill that you give me, I don't think you'd want to kill me. Mm -hmm. Would they kill the prophets who came saying that you would be healed of any disease right now if you would purchase this miracle faith water or this trinket, or this bauble, or... No, they don't kill those. I'm sure you get the idea, all right? You may not like it, but I'm sure you get the idea. No, they did not kill the false prophets. Their prophets. Right. They never killed their prophets. Prophets. But in Lamentations 2.14, God spoke through Jeremiah and said, Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions. And they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity because they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. They did kill God's prophets who came fulfilling the role that the Lord had called them to, exposing the sin, the people's iniquity, so that they could be restored from captivity because sin always makes one captive. Right? Jesus said, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. 
Now, discernment of spirit. We all have those of us who are filled with the spirit of God. We have discernment as a gift of the spirit. And we are commanded, commanded, underlying commanded. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. First John 4, 1. It is God's desire that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9. So he sends prophets to call people to repentance so that they can be partakers of the promise. Do you want the promise of God? Always. Say yes. Yes. Okay, all right. Say yes. <clears throat> and this is the promise of God. This is the promise which he himself made to us. Eternal life. First John 2, 25. That's what it says. The promise he made to us is eternal life. The focus of the Lord is eternity. The focus of natural man who cannot accept the things of God because they're spiritually appraised is the here and now. The things of this world. That's what you want if you're walking in the flesh. He can. God can. He will bless you in this life. He will. It just depends on what blesses you. It says in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But I promise you, I promise you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, if you truly delight yourself in the Lord, he will become the desire of your heart. The response of God to all of this, well, continuing on in Amos chapter 2, starting at verse 14, he says, Flight will perish from the swift, and the stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. That's the result of not accepting the repentance that God is offering. You see, shortly after or basically and concurrently with Amos, the Lord would speak to the prophet Isaiah, who was in the south, and say this. Therefore, my people go into captivity for their lack of knowledge and their honorable men are famished. Their honorable men are parched with thirst. Isaiah 513. They go into captivity. You know, captivity, it's very interesting. The Hebrew is very interesting because what it literally says is they're denuded. They're stripped because of their lack of knowledge. That's because typically back in those days when, when somebody, when one country army conquered another, they would strip them of all their possessions. They would strip them of everything and carry them off into captivity. Mm -hmm. So that word gola in Hebrew, literally, which means denuded, that's what it meant to be taken into captivity. What God is saying here, too, is there's no solutions in the world. No. Your own strength can't do it. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. But he will do it when you turn and ask him. Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. False prophets can only give you false knowledge. Well, there we go. Father, we just thank you for this time, which flies by, Lord God. We thank you for it. We ask you to bless every ear that's heard, Lord God. And we will be back next week to carry on with your word for the glory of your name, Father. And we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well. God bless you. Until next time, be used for His glory. Hallelujah.